A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is The Journey, the radio ministry of Bethel Church in Northwest Indiana, featuring the teaching of Steve DeWitt. Are you engaged in the culture? What does that even look like politically, humanly? What about spiritually? What does it look like as a Christian to be engaged in our world around us? That's what we're looking at today on The Journey. One of the ways we at The Journey are working to engage our culture is social media. Have you joined our new Facebook page? You can find us by searching for thejourney.media. Every day we post a morning devotional and in the afternoon and evening, a prayer. So please join us online. We would love to get to know you better. We're in Matthew chapter 5 today. Here's Steve. Today we uh, take our next step in this journey and I want to review. We took a look at the astounding statement that the Apostle Paul makes when he says in Romans 9 verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Essentially, the Apostle Paul says, I would go to hell if I thought doing that would mean that my brothers would come to faith in Christ. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement. I don't know very many people that could say that. But the Apostle Paul does. And we ask the question, where does that kind of passion for people come from? If it's so unusual, and we don't seem to see it in our day, and maybe we look in the mirror and we say, you know what, I don't see that in my heart either, where does it come from? How did the Apostle Paul have this kind of a heart to reach out to people with the gospel? And so then we turned to 2 Corinthians 5, where the Apostle Paul says this, it is the love of Christ that constrains me. It is the love of Christ that has a grip on my heart and on my conscience. And we saw that it is the love of Christ when I realize how unworthy I am to be loved by Christ. It is a powerful motivation to take that saving message of the gospel with compassion and with love to the people around me because I have tasted of the grace of God myself. Which is another way of saying this, all about him means we're all about them, which keeps us from being all about us and keeps me from being all about me. Healthy Christians are others focused. Healthy churches are externally focused. They are not about their own comforts. They're not about their own personal preference or whatever it is. They are asking the question, what can we do to reach people with the gospel? So today we take the next step in our little journey here and I'm asking this question today. Is getting beyond these walls a command or just a good idea that well-meaning people will come to? Is it something that we can do if we want to or is it something that we ought to be doing? And already some of you are going, I know where he's going with that one. Don't even need to preach it. We know the answer to that one. Well, just bear with me because we want to take that apart. Then what should happen when we do go beyond these walls And then really to kind of dream together a little bit and to ask, what could happen in Northwest Indiana if we should, with a renewed commitment, be a missional and transformational church body in this community? So to that end, we come to God's Word now, and I'd like to ask you to turn to Matthew 5 with me. Matthew 5, we'll be studying verses 12 through 16. This is a section of the Bible that is very well known. It is called, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And it is probably the most famous sermon of all time. And uh, the passage that we're studying comes on the heels of what we also call the Beatitudes. So right after the Beatitudes, we come to this statement from Christ, beginning in verse 13. He says this, you, Bethel, you ready? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown 
out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is a passage of Scripture that talks about the church in the world. The church in the world. And of course, Jesus is the master illustrator, and he was so good at taking complex and profound truth and illustrating it in a way that average Joes or Josephines like you and me are able to understand it. And so here he takes something very common. What's more common than salt and light? Even 2,000 years ago, what was more common than salt and light? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Two metaphors, two illustrations. And we can ask the question, what do salt and light have in common? And the answer is, is that they are influencers. Wherever salt goes, it has an effect. Go down to, the, go down to Florida and look at uh, houses and, and uh, look at boats uh, that are salt water boats in the docks in South Florida, and you will see that salt has an effect everywhere that it goes. Light is the same way. Everywhere light goes, it has an influence. It does something. It is transformational. So let's talk about these two metaphors. First of all, salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. And in the culture of the day, salt had two primary functions. First of all, it was used as a preservative. They would take salt and they would rub it into the meat uh, in order to slow down the process of decay. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have deep freezers. And so preserving food was very critical. To this day, you can go to the Middle East. You can walk around. They have all of these, and this is true in other parts of the world. They have all of these open-air food markets where they have meat hanging from hooks all over the place. And it's, I won't even go into the detail, but I will tell you, as you walk through those kind of places, it is not for the faint of heart. Not at all. And I'll just stop right there. But you walk around and you realize, like, how long has this been hanging here? You know, you're kind of like, and you wonder at the restaurant, you know, that kind of thing. So you just don't ask questions and you just eat it. But you see how important, you just, you see how important it was in the day for them to be able to preserve food. And so salt was a preservative for food. Salt was also used the way that we use salt, primarily. When you're at the, at the lunch table today and somebody says, would you please pass the salt, you're not thinking in your mind, oh, they want to preserve the food. No. What are they using the salt for? Because it adds flavor, doesn't it? It brings out the flavor. There is nothing better in the world than a juicy steak with a layer of salt across the top of it. Are you with me? All right. I love it. Love it. Somebody told me recently that you could put salt on watermelon, which I did not grow up doing that, but apparently some uh, wacky people do that as well, okay, because it brings out the flavor. We understand that. Salt gives flavor. And Jesus says here, you are the salt of the earth. And the you here is Christians, Okay, he's not using it the way that in our culture this has become, you know, people will say, oh, those people, they are salt of the earth kind of people. And now what do, in our culture, what do we mean by that? They are so nice. He's not talking about nice people. It's not niceness that Jesus has in mind here. We know that because he speaks in verse 12 to people that are going to get reward in heaven, and that would have to be Christians. So Christians are the salt of the earth. Now, he goes on to ask the question, if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? If salt no longer has the effect that it is supposed to have, what good is the salt, he says? It's only good for throwing it out and just walking on it. That's all that you would ever do with salt that isn't salty. The second metaphor, he says, is you are the light of the world. And of course, this is the verse that inspires the children's song. They might be singing it today. I don't know. Uh, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Okay? And on the song goes. So our children are singing this verse. I want to ask the question today, 
do we understand it? Do we really understand what Jesus is saying when he says that uh, we are the light of the world and we're not to put it under a bushel? Now, this is a little confusing, I think, on the surface because Jesus says elsewhere, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Okay, Jesus, well, which one is it? Are we the light of the world or are you the light of the world? And to answer that, we could ask this question, uh, which gives light to the world, the sun or the moon? And the answer is, both do. <laughs> Apparently that wasn't clear. Both <laughs> do. We had a full moon, I think, this week. I was out walking and I saw a full moon, and you can walk at night with a full moon. Both give light, but there's a very fundamental difference between the light that the sun gives and the light that the moon gives. The light that the sun gives is a source light. It is self-generating light. The light of the moon is a reflected light, but both give light to the world. And in this case, Jesus is the sun. Okay, we don't have inherently this like moral goodness that we sort of shine brightly to the world. Our glory is a reflected glory. It is the life of Christ in us. He is living it out in us. We are being made into the likeness of Christ. So when we do something that is light exuding, it is Christ's life in us that is being, that is being lived out. He is the source. But we give light to the world. And that's why he uses the metaphor of light. He says that you are like a city on a hill. And think back 2,000 years ago, they would build cities on hills. Why? Because it was easy to defend the city. They had to think about that kind of thing more than we do today. So the cities were on hills, and that meant that you could see them from a long ways away. Why? Because whenever you have a city, you have light. There are campfires, and there are candles, and there are, in our day, there are lights. If, I mean, you can see Chicago from here at night. The city of Chicago lights up the sky, even from where we live here. You fly into Chicago at night. There's, there's no mistaking when you're no longer over the cornfields and you are now over the city of Chicago. Why? Because you can be at 30,000 feet and you can look down and say, look, there's the city of Chicago. Can you see the Sears Tower? No, but I see light. It just exudes from the city. And he says that you are like that. You are light that everybody around is supposed to see. And that's why he says nobody lights a light and then puts it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? It doesn't make sense. Lights are for the purpose of displaying brightness and lighting up the room. So to hide it under a bushel defeats the purpose. Our kids understand that. I wonder if we really understand it today. And then he concludes with this statement, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So you say, well, what is my light? If I have light, if I'm a Christian, what is my light? And verse 12 says that our light is or are the good deeds that we do. Oh, good. It's religion. It's about doing good deeds. We've got to be good people. No, it's not that fundamentally. Our good deeds are the byproduct of our faith in Christ. This is not some kind of a, a uh, works-generated, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good with God because of the good things that I do. No, it is faith in Christ first. And then that transformation in my life does produce a life of obedience, which he here calls good deeds, that the world around sees and it actually has an evangelistic purpose. It leads them to praising the Father in heaven. So we find that salt and light both have an effect wherever they go. Wherever they are, they are having an influence. They are transformational. Now last week, I shared with you my perspective on the last nine years that I've been here at Bethel. And I said that basically, this is now my perspective, just my perspective, but basically over the last nine years, we have worked very hard at developing the ministries within our church, from the children's ministries to the kinship ministries to all the other ministries that we got going on. We have been working very hard to develop them, to get good leadership in place, to have a philosophy that we can share and to build that ministry up and to build the church up. And here you are today, many of you as a result of that. And we're thankful for that. There is nothing wrong with that, nothing at all, not going to change that. We only want to see that grow and improve. You see, the problem that we have is that as long as the salt 
is in the salt shaker, what good is it? What happens, in fact, when you leave salt for a long time in a salt shaker? Do you know what happens? It gets crusty, doesn't it? And then you got to, like, get a knife and just jam it in there and get all that loose. And that's kind of what this series is a little bit, is this thing right here. You shake it up like that so that you can shake it out, okay? Salt. We can enjoy the experience of being in the salt shaker. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Kind of cozy, being with other salt grains like ourselves. We feel very comfortable in there. And you know what we can do also? You can read books about the adventures that other salt had when they left the salt shaker. <laughs> and think about, wow, think of what that would be like. Isn't it wonderful what that other salt is doing as it gets out of the salt shaker? What a wonderful thing it is. And there we sit, getting, getting crusty and comfortable and complacent and thinking it's just all about us and our little salt shaker that we're so happy with. And friends, the Word of God and Jesus is that salt, to have its effect, has to get out of the salt shaker. It's of no value, essentially, to its purpose as long as it stays inside the salt shaker. And so where are we going with beyond these walls? We are merely shaking the salt or wanting to shake the salt out of this salt shaker here at Bethel into a community that desperately needs the transformational effect that the power of God, it's not us, okay? It is not us, but it is the power of God, the life of Christ lived out in us in a context that is dark and hopeless and needing the power of Jesus Christ in their life. Do we believe that? Okay, let's believe that together. That must be true. And if you listen, I want you to try this at lunch. I don't know if you've ever listened carefully as you've sake, salted something, but at lunch today, you try this. Get really close and start going out like this. And you know what you're gonna hear? No. We like it in here. <laughs> I don't want to go. You try it. I'm serious. That's what the salt does as it goes out. And as you hear that, I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look and say, good for nothing, salt. Because that's what Jesus says. Salt that is not having its effect is good for nothing salt. And we don't want to be a good for nothing church, do we? See the point? For salt to have its influence and for light to have its effect, both have to be in the culture to have that kind of influence. And when the salt gets out of the salt shaker, that's what happens. That's what happens. It has an effect, or at least it's supposed to. I came across this story. It's just a powerful example of what the saltiness of Christianity ought to be like and and Woodrow Wilson, I'll just tell you the story. Woodrow Wilson, 28th president of the United States, told the story of being in a barber shop one time. And now I'm quoting. I was sitting in a barber chair when I became aware that a powerful personality had entered the room. A man had come quietly in upon the same errand as myself to have his hair cut and sat in the chair next to me. Every word the man uttered, though it was not in the least didactic, showed a personal interest in the man who was serving him. And before I got through with what was being done to me, I was aware I had attended an evangelistic service because Mr. D.L. Moody was in that chair. I purposely lingered in the room after he had left and noted the singular effect that his visit had brought upon the barbershop. They talked in undertones. They did not know his name, but they knew something had elevated their thoughts, and I felt that I left that place as I should have left a place of worship. And I read that, and you know what I felt? I felt guilty. I, all too often, am checking out at the cashier with no interest in the cashier, getting my hair cut with little interest in the destiny of the person cutting my hair, or the thousands of other interactions that we have with people in the community 
where we can just be as rude as all the other people and not have an effect, not be salt, not be light. And friends, I would suggest to you that's what influence looks like. That's what Jesus is talking about. And this leads, to, I think, to several questions that we will address later. How can the church be in the world without being sullied by it? We're going to talk about that. How do we let our light shine before men exactly? Like, what is that about? But this morning, I want to answer the question, what should be our attitude in going into the world? What should our way of thinking be? And so for this, we're going to turn to one other passage today. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9. The Apostle Paul, again, is going to be our example We begin in verse 19. This is what he says. Actually, let me give you the context first. That way, when we read it, you'll understand a little bit better. The Apostle Paul is defending his rights as an apostle. And he says in verse 3 that as an apostle that has seen the risen Lord, doesn't he have all the other rights that the other apostles do? Doesn't he have the right to financial support? Doesn't he have the right uh, to take a, a wife along with him like Peter did and the other apostles? However, while he has the right, he says in verse 12 that he chooses to put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. He had the right to financial aid, but guess what he did? He made tents so that nobody could say, you know, question the reason that he was doing his ministry. So the important thing to Paul is the gospel ministry. Everything else is set aside for that. And now we come to verse 19 where it says, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I become weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So the Apostle Paul says, the big thing to me, the main thing to me is the gospel ministry. Do I have rights as an apostle? Yes, I do. But I, you know what? I'm not going to exert those rights because I want to win as many as possible. Which, of course, is the same thing that our Savior Christ did. Philippians 2 makes it clear. He is the Son of God. All the rights and privileges that were his. And yet, in spite of that, it says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Christ gave up kingdom rights for kingdom purposes. He set aside the glory of heaven to come to earth and to die for us. That's what he did. That was his attitude. And that's the same attitude that we find with Paul. He willingly sets aside things that in his own maybe flash desires he would want to do. Why? For the sake of the gospel. He kept the main thing, the main thing. And he gives a few examples now. He says, first of all, the way that I minister to Jews. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. When I'm talking to Jews, I'm building bridges the way that it takes to build bridges with with the Jews. Some examples of this would be, he had Timothy circumcised to avoid offense in Acts 16 to the Jews. He participated in a Jewish purification ceremony to show that he was not abandoning the Old Testament law. And when he spoke to the Jews, he would quote the Old Testament. I wrote my master's thesis on this point, that when he talked to Jews, he spoke like a Jew. He quotes the Old Testament. Read in Acts 13, his message to Pisidian Antioch. It is an Old Testament exegesis of Christ as Messiah. He's talking like a Jew and when he's ministering to the Jews. Learning to speak the language, even the cultural language of the group you're trying to reach is important in sharing the message of Christ. Tomorrow, more from Pastor Steve and his message, Engaging the Culture. You're listening to The Journey with Steve DeWitt. And in addition to the broadcast, The Journey also has teaching material available on our website, thejourney.fm. Just click on the teaching tab. There you can find the message notes for each day, along with additional resources that relate to our current study. Check it out at thejourney.fm. Thanks for listening. For Steve and the whole team, I'm Tim Svoboda. We'll see you next time right here on The Journey.